Good evening, church, and welcome to another Wednesday night service. Uh, my name is Benjamin Savala, and I have the pleasure of standing before you once again to share the word and uh, walk through this word a little bit tonight. Uh, once again, I always count it an honor uh, to stand before you. Um, I know this is, this is not something to be taken lightly, and I, I, do, I do enjoy uh, ministering the word. So I thank the pastors uh, for giving me this time and, um, to share. Uh, tonight, uh, if you look at the background, um, the title of my message is Desiring More. Well, that's a question, okay? I know in the, in the past couple of uh, messages that I've done, I do tend to ask some of those uh, in question, uh, the questions that we should be asking ourselves. And tonight's going to be no different. So, we've entered into February 2022. Okay, how, how time flies. Um, you know, we started off this year, and it seemed like January just flew by. And uh, it's, uh, it seems like time's speeding up, and uh, we got to enjoy, enjoy the time that we have. So tonight... Um, I will be ministering out of the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15. And I'm going to be uh, reading through one, uh, verse 1 through 31. And I know it's a lot of scripture, but um, this is what God kind of put on my heart. <clears throat> and it kind of spoke to me about what we struggle with uh, in our day-to-day um, relationship with God. And basically, um, I kept thinking about what, it, what is it, Lord, that you want me to, to speak about? And there's one word that stuck out, and it's intimacy. So I'm going to challenge you right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to go Google, break out a dictionary if you have one, and look up the word intimacy. Now, through all my years of ministry, uh, small group leader, uh, minister, you know, I, I've, I've done a variety of, of, of ministries, and I've talked to a variety of people. I have also, if you know my background, um, I've had my fair share of counseling as well, marital uh, counseling um, in my past. And this is one of the key problems uh, in relationships in general is intimacy. And I, I'm going to get to why, why that, that, that's a, an important part of what, what we're, we're trying to learn today. But uh, we are going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 through 31. You're going to have to bear with me as I read this. Once again, I, I, I do encourage you to break out your Bible. Read it along with me. Whatever translation you have is fine. Read it so that you see, and you could go back and mark down what, what things um, kind of stick out to you. So let me start by opening up in prayer, and we'll, we'll get started. Father God, I thank you for this time that you've given me, the ability that you've placed upon me. Father God, I pray that I use it to its full benefit, Lord. I pray that you bless this time. Have your hand upon those that are listening. I pray that it would challenge them, Father God, and they, they would receive it well. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verses 1 through 31. This is a story about Saul and the man of God, Samuel. Um, it might be a familiar uh, scripture for you, but please just read along with me, starting with verse 1. It says, Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel, now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them, in Telaim. 
200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. Verse 8. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Verse 10, Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from, me, from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel. And indeed, he set up a monument for himself, and he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel said to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Verse 14. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep, of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the ox which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest went, or the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak on. So Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of all the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord has sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Verse 19. Why then do you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why do you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Verse 21, But the people took the plunder, took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great... Uh, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Verse 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned away to go, uh, turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe, and it tore. So Samuel said to him, "The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of, the, of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man." that he should relent. Verse 30. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. 
So you, you have to bear with me on this one. <clears throat> Saul was chosen as a young man to be king over Israel. Samuel was the one, was the one that went and anointed him. And when you think about this story, God sent a man to Saul to make him king over his people. Now, much in the way that, that God sent Christ to be king over our lives, now there's a, there's a big difference between Saul and Christ, okay? Big difference. But if you really read the story, you see Saul neglected the important part of what was given to him. So even though God chose him, there was no intimacy between him and God. And in the same way, the way Christ has chose you and me, we can make the same mistake. See, we could, we could do the empty actions. We could do the things that are easy to us. We could put on a face. We could put on an act. But if we lack intimacy, we will miss what it is that Christ wants for us. See, there's so much that we miss on a day-to-day -day because there is an enemy and the enemy is out there and doing a very good job of distracting us. And unfortunately, a lot of us get sucked into that. Wherever you're at in your relationship with Christ, you should be desiring more. And once again, this word intimacy, it's one of the things that is greatly missing in all of our relationships. See, because sometimes intimacy could be uncomfortable or cause discomfort. And you say, well, how is that, Ben? How is that intimacy can cause discomfort? Well, like, like relationship, there are a list of things that we need to maintain. Communication, patience, time, effort, money. Relationship does cost us something. And if you read your Bible, anything worth anything does cost you something. And sometimes the greater the cost, the better the relationship. Now, I don't know if I, I've, probably, I've probably ministered on, on this about what it, what it means to love. To lay down your life for somebody. To lay down your wants, to lay down your needs, to lay down your opinion, to lay down your anger, to lay down your frustration. To lay down your opinion. And in some cases, to lay down your pride, even if you're right. Relationships cost. Now the reward, though, when we make those sacrifices, when we, when we yield and give those things, is intimacy. So much, much like in the way that a, that a marriage works, it requires us to go above and beyond what we desire to do. Because what does it take to maintain a relationship? What, it's, it's not like the, the, that a relationship will just function on its own. 
It takes effort from, our, for, from us. It takes effort from our partner. It takes time, finances, patience, frustration. It's all those things. And it's not much different with the Lord. See, He wants our time. He wants our attention. And ultimately, He wants, he wants us to acknowledge our dependency on Him. And uh, what I mean by that is this. We, we strike off and we try to do things on our own. That's not what God wants. That's not what God wants. See, we think we know better. So we say, okay, oh, I, I got the plan. God's given me this. God's done this for me. I'm, I, I'm going to take it and I'm going to run with it. And we try to get ahead of God. When if we took the time to get to know the God that we serve, it wouldn't be a mistake that we would make. Because one of the benefits of intimacy is I know. I know in here and up here what God wants from me. Now, it's taken me years to get to this this point in my life where, where I start to see and understand how this is working out. It just seems the more obedient that I am with God, the more willing I am to sacrifice to Him, the more obedient that I become with Him, the clearer the picture and the clearer the path that he sets before me. And I know for new believers, this is, a, this is a struggle. But God asks for a relationship. And to know him more and more. This is why as, as ministers, you will always hear them say, read your word. How do you get to know someone as deeply as the disciples did, that stood before him, that saw what was coming, that saw the miracles. How do you get to know the will of the Father if you're unreally, unwilling to read his word? See, because these are stories. These are, these are, are someone's stories about their walk with Christ about what they witnessed, about what they saw, about what they felt. People who were intimately involved with the God that we actively serve. This is why we emphasize prayer. When we sit down with our Father, when we make time, and I'm going to say that, make time. It's not about us having time. Do you, do you make time or do you just have time for your relationships? No, you have to make time. You could be busy with work, with, with whatever it is, uh, uh, outside, of, outside of work, home, whatever it is. You have to make time. You have to make relationships a priority for you to, to, to have them grow. And in the same way, our relationship with Christ. We have to give time. If we're unwilling to give the time, there's not, intim there's not much intimacy that will be had. Now, I want to use this, this next scripture because it was, it was a parable, and uh, some of you are familiar with the parable of the sower, and I'm reading it out of Mark chapter 4. Verses 3 through 8. And this is the, the first part. Mark chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. It says, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground, where it did not have much earth. And immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up and it, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Verse 7. 
And now the seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a good crop that sprang up, increased and produced some thirtyfold, sixtyfold, or some sixty, and some a hundred. <clears throat> now you have a variety of, uh, of, of soils and ground that this, this, this specific scripture is talking about. And I will say, by, by my own experience, we have the ability to fall into any number of these soils. How much preparation, how much sacrifice, how much obedience determines what ground you are sowing. See, because you could place yourself in a position to receive or in a position to reject. If you don't want to give the time, if you don't want to read, if you don't want to understand, if you don't want to make church a priority, if you don't want to make God a priority, if you don't want to make your prayer time a priority, if you don't want to make your reading a priority, you're putting yourself in a position of rejection so that when God comes and places the opportunity, you can do nothing but reject it because you have not taken the time to prepare yourself to receive. And some of it's not our fault. Once again, there's an enemy that lives and, and rules in this world, and we have to contend with that. But the Bible calls us to do our best. And our best is different than everybody else's. I could look back 10 years ago and say that, that my best now is nothing in, in comparison to what I can do now. But it's a growing thing. As I grow in Christ, I grow in the strengths that He gives me, which allows me a greater and stronger mind, heart, and soul for Him that puts me in a better position always to be in a position to receive versus in a position to re reject. See, sin will, will put us in a position to reject all the time because we don't, we, we, you know... Let me, let me say it this way. To know someone intimacy, intimately is to know them inside. You could look at, uh, if you have a good friend, a spouse, you can tell when they're hurting. You can tell when they're angry. But intimacy goes a little further than that. Because there's certain expectations that you begin to see from somebody. It's from your friends and family, spouses, children. When you begin to cross into intimacy and build on that, you begin to know more and more about that person or subject that you are investing in. And in the same way, our Heavenly Father, if we will take the time to become intimate with Christ. He will take the limitations off of you. He will take the restrictions off of you. And you will begin to see and know what God wants and expects from you. Continuing on, Mark chapter 4, now verses 13 through 20. This is Christ giving the ex explanation of the parable. Verse 13, And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure only a, for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. Verse 19. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in choke the word 
and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word accept it and bear fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100-fold. So you have an example here of, of what takes place. Some things the enemy comes and takes, depending on where you're at. But when you go down that verse 20, it says, but these are the ones sown on good ground, those who hear the word and accept it. See, if we're not actively pursuing relationship with Christ, it's going to be hard for us, very hard for us to accept the word. See, because the Bible, the Bible describes the word as sharp. It will challenge you. It will challenge the thoughts that you have. It will challenge the ideas that you have, that you have developed, or that the enemy has sown. And the reason why it needs to be sharp is it has to be able to cut those things out of us. See, a lot of people will read the word and say, oh, I don't necessarily accept that. Uh, I don't really agree with that. And even in those statements, you could hear the rejection of it. See, us as, as followers of Christ, those of us that call ourselves disciples, we are doing our best to make, to, to make our lives match what the Word says. We are comparing ourselves to the Word and seeing where we need to, where we need to grow, where we need to put our, our effort. Once again, in our relationship, putting effort in, putting time in, putting patience in. So that we could be intimate with our God. So that we could know when the times of trials come, when the tribulation comes, we know we are safe because we know what God is doing. Because we know His heart for us. That it's not to harm us, it's to develop us. Through everything that goes on, we begin to see God is at work. Yeah, this looks negative. Yeah, this looks bad. Yeah, I lost my job. And let me give you an example. I had to lose a job that I thought I would have for a lifetime to get a better one. Let me say that again. I had to lose a job that I thought I would have forever to get a better one. See, we think in our heads, ah, man, what is God doing? And that statement alone is very telling. What is God doing? God wants the best for us. You read his word, he wants the best for us. He has a plan for us. He has a desire for our lives. He has a work for us to do. And through that work, through that development, through all those things, we become better. We become greater through him. But once again, if we don't, if we can't input or sacrifice the time, going back to our first scripture, 1 Samuel chapter 15, obedience is greater than sacrifice. See, we could, we could come and we could give our time, effort, money to some degree and not give our all. We only begin to get intimacy with God when we are willing to give our all. We have to lay down everything that's stopping us from getting closer to God. Matthew chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have 
need of before you ask him. A, a statement of intimacy. Your father knows what you need before you ask. That, that right there, that one sentence describes a position, a place of where we need to desire to be in order to have this type of relationship when we go before God. So that He knows of our need through our intimacy with Him that we have already done, that we have already worked for, that we already continue to, per, to push to get. Once again, it's not, I don't, I don't want to minimize. I don't want to minimize this. It does cost, but you have to be willing to make the payment. We started this year, already a month in, less of me and more of you. So let me turn it around. Just a little bit. More of me, more of my effort, more of my strength, more of my emotions, more of my thoughts that I will now give to you, Lord. I will now give you more of me in order to receive more of you. See, because I need to make room. I need to make room in this vessel. To receive more of, of Him, I need to empty out what I have. The things that I hold back, the things that, are, that I'm holding within, the things that I'm keeping are a block for what God wants to place in me. My fears, my failures, my shame, my condemnation, the, the things of this world, they are trying to stop me. I need to be able to give those to Him. I need to give more of me to God to receive more of Him. Less of me and more of Him. I hope you caught that. Our sacrifices and our work are not in vain. You know, I reached points in my walk where I thought, God, what, why? This is, this is not working. This is not paying off. This effort, this striving, this pain is not working. And I could look back at those times and see that even in my complaint, I was taking it to the Lord in hopes that He would hear me. And I look back now and say, wow, your word does not come back void, Lord. the cover that was over my eyes that I couldn't see. I couldn't see ahead was preventing me from seeing where the payoff was and how it would come. In my walk with God, God has not failed me. My effort, my sacrifice, my obedience, pay off in every aspect of my life. And the more that I'm willing to be obedient, the more that I'm willing to sacrifice, the more that I'm willing to give, the, willing that I, the more that I'm willing to do, the more that God gives for me to do. The more blessing that He gives to me. The more joy and peace that He gives to me. For those of you that have been on the hard road, who feel like it's not paying off, give it some time. 
Give it some time. You keep putting your best foot forward. You keep doing your best. And God will multiply that for your life. Now I'm going to close with the scripture, Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 through 13. Once again, that was Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 through 13. And it says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and Find me when you search for me with all your heart. We have to be genuine about our desire. Whether we truly want relationship, whether we truly want intimacy with God, depends on what we're willing to give. to give your whole self complete with flaws failures because that's what he wants he wants to take all these things that we see as holdbacks and hold downs and show us how he could turn them around into some of our biggest motivators motivators some of our biggest achievements Intimacy with God. Are we desiring more? Because it's there. Less of me, more of you. But remember, you can't get more unless we're really willing to release more of us. Amen. I pray that you enjoyed this message. And I pray that you join us on our Sunday night sir, our Sunday morning services at 1015. Um, it is a wonderful time to be in the presence of the Lord and to come together in fellowship in the flesh. Amen. I uh, pray you have a blessed night. Thank you.